well known in the RV and marine space, they wanted to be known in the motorcycle space. So they bought us, the consulting company. We had over 400 dealerships that we tracked data for. They wanted to put their product into all those places. They kept everybody in the same place. We became the Assurance 20 Club Division. In 2009, they decided they'd make a hell of a lot more money on RVs and marine stuff than they do in the motorcycle industry per contract, so they bailed, right? When they bailed, they decided to, publicly held company, just dismantle the entire 20 Club division. They literally just, somebody with a pencil in New York just went, that division's gone. Right? 93 of us were like, what the hell just happened? <laughs> Best thing that ever happened to me. I became an independent contractor. Um, and this was in, this was in uh, 2009. So I started working with Harley. I started doing a bunch of work with Harley. I worked with Articat. I was working with Ducati. Greg Heichelbeck made the transition over into Triumph and he picked me up to run the Triumph 20 Clubs. So now I play with a whole bunch of manufacturers. Um, we launched Sam's Power Sports Garage, of which I know there's several of you in the dealership who train off of that website. That was in 2012. We launched a bunch of the videos there and the whole idea was that why don't we just film some of the stuff that I do and put it online because there's only so many places that I could get to and I was gone every week anyhow. Um, so we launched this thing and then all along the way I start running into Tony Gonzalez, which Tony was a friend of mine from the, I mean Tony and Schooley and I go way, way back. Um, but Tony was doing training for Gart Sutton at the time and we started running into each other in the airports and everything and Tony worked with me. I brought him on to Lemco three, four years we worked together. And so we start bumping into each other. And what I, I owned all the intellectual property to Lemco and the management programs, which were so successful, we ran over 500 managers through them. I wanted to relaunch them, but I didn't have the resources, the people, the trainers to be able to relaunch some of this stuff that I wanted to do up to and including relaunching a whole bunch of private 20 clubs, not just the ones that I was doing for the OEMs. So Tony and I got together. We decided to uh, put the band back together, if you will. And that was in July 1st of last year. We relaunched uh, what essentially was Lemco Management Group and it became Garage Composites. So this is the live version, the 20 clubs. We have 20 clubs, private groups. We have 10 private groups that we were on right now. Um, and that's where a lot of the content comes from. We relaunched all the management programs. These are nine month long management programs of which we have right about 80 people going through the management programs right now. Um, and then most recently, on the water sports side of things, the, the online web version of this company, we play in the marine space as well. We're gonna launch in the 20 club space on the marine side next year. We're also gonna be at Interbike. Uh, for those of you who are into bicycles, um, we're gonna be playing in the bicycle space as well, want-based emotional purchases. And if you sit here and you think bicycles, you know what a high-end bicycle goes for right now? A Trek Madone is a $14,000 bicycle. Okay, that's, that's the Trek high-end uh, road bike. <laughs> that's why I wear, according to Schooley, my old man slippers. <laughs> I'm saving my engines for the weekend. <laughs> yeah, no engines, right? But the, the point is, everything that I walk through in a boot camp with you guys, everything you hear from anyone in my company, it comes from absolute proven practices in the industry. Their best practices as played out in the composite. It's not someone's guess, it's not someone's thinking, it's not an idea. It's an idea that became a practical application that became the new best practice. You couple that with the emotional side of human connection and behavioral psychology, and it's really easy to figure out what works in the industry. So I think it's important that you guys know where so much of this content comes from. Fair enough? Okay. Let, I, I want to talk to you a little bit before lunch about Harley Davidson. And by the way, the fact that this was supposed to be a nine to five meeting, uh, there's only about six and a half hours of classroom material that anybody can absorb, no matter how good the material is, no matter who's training it. Literally, I will see it in your eyes right around three to 3.30, you're, uh, you, you just shut down. You'll start to shut down. So we're gonna finish no later than four today, not five because we started early, just so you know that. I bump lunch up to 11.30, so we got a lunch coming in about 25 minutes, right? So stay with me on this. Just at, at the point where you figure you're checking out, it's okay, just let me know, like I'm out, dude, put a pen down, close the book. I, I, somewhere around 3.30-ish to four, we'll, uh, we'll break for the day, okay? But I do want to get into some of the MIC data before lunch because I wanna set the tone 
for you know triumph black and what we're trying to create on that side of the fence and why it works so much it's so much dialed into human behavior it's not dialed into oh it's a cool display and here's some stuff on a wall and here's that cool looking parts thing that what is that thing by the way richard what is that thing triumph black that parts display thing do you have do you have a name for that thing that thing that goes up on the wall triumph world black yeah but that huh what's it called hero bays it's like a stencil looking thing that goes on the wall no <laughs> I'll figure it out at lunch F minus no <laughs> all right I'll figure that out at lunch I'll have the better question I don't have the data to have the right question apparently so uh, let's quit that so here let's go back to um, I got one I have one more bullet point to show you out of this industry council statistical annual I've already shown you a couple here's the last one I want to show you then we'll do some market share stuff here before lunch there you go motorcycle retail outlets 10,101 retail outlets selling motorcycles and related products okay um, 46 percent authorized to sell new motorcycles scooters all-terrain vehicles ATV. okay all the major brands 46 percent of that number which is roughly 4650 ish dealers in the country able to sell one of the major brands or multiple of the major brands okay 54 percent don't carry a major brand 54% of the 10,000 plus dealers in the country don't carry a major brand. My question to you is why do they exist? How are they allowed to exist? Wouldn't you think people would rather just go, I call it the mothership. Wouldn't you just go to the mothership? Like there's a, there's a little fly-by-night store over there that also carries a lot of the same similar product. Wouldn't you just go to the damn mothership? How are they allowed to exist? A feeling that a dealership is a ripoff could be absolutely yeah Javier or they already had, an experience that was not had a bad experience at the dealership okay what else think about that so a perception that the big box stores the Walmart experience and I'll tell you one of the hardest things in the world is when you go from the little mom-and-pop shop to the bigger store retaining that culture one of the hardest things to do in a motorcycle industry what else? Places like Cycle Beer buy a huge quantity that they can sell a lot cheaper than dealers with a big brand smaller. So your perception is that I get a better deal at one of those stores. Perception being key there. Not absolute fact, perception. They're not focused on a single product and they need to be more focused on people than product. Hmm. Interesting. School, you got something there? No. <laughs> so at the end of the day. They think they're gonna get a better price. They think they're gonna get a different experience. Maybe it's closer, right? Um, maybe the breadth of inventory is bigger. The selection is better than what you guys carry at your own store. I can't tell you how many times I've gone into stores that carry an awesome display of unbelievable motorcycles and then HJC helmets. And I'm like, where's the eye? Where's the showy? Oh, we don't carry those. Okay, just my head. You wouldn't want to put the high end, give me a chance at a $700 helmet. You just want me to buy the $100 helmet. All right. So it could be a perception of, but let me ask you, show of hands. How many of you have knowingly and willingly paid more for something because you like where you bought it from or who you bought it from? Show of hands. Put them up. Never done it? You've never done it. You ever had a beer at a bar? Yeah. You've done it. <laughs> Why don't you just drink the beer at home on your couch? It's cheaper, 7-Eleven, it's half the price. You go to the bar, right? Because you, it's, you're knowingly paying for the experience of the people, right? And again, well, once you get the idea of a $5 beer, it's just scale. It's just scale after that. $5 probably means a lot less to you today than it did 20 years ago. It's just like for most people, a $20,000 bike when you're in your 50s probably means less to you than a $20,000 bike when you're 18 years old. My first bike was a $500 1976 Suzuki GS 550L. And to date, probably my favorite bike ever because it was my first bike. 
right? About 500 bucks was every penny I had to my name. Everything I could scrape together. 500 bucks means less to me now than it did then. Still 500 bucks, it's just different perspective, right? So everybody in the rooms knowingly and willingly paid more for something. How many of you have knowingly and willingly driven past some place that might have something in stock to get to your favorite place that you know has it in stock? Show of hands. <clears throat> okay, so it's not proximity. How many of you have knowingly and willingly waited for your favorite place to get something in stock as opposed to buying it today because you'd rather buy it from your favorite place? Do you get my point? It's not proximity, it's not urgency, and it's not price tag. The only answer you can give me is they're getting something there that they're not getting from you. Perceived or otherwise, they're getting something there. And at the point where you say, well, Sam, come on, man. I mean, I, I don't want to drive an hour to get to that store when there's a place 10 minutes away. If that were 10% of the stores out there, okay. Okay, I get it. 54% of the stores that sell the exact same stuff that you sell, 54, unacceptable. You should be putting them out of business. You should just be destroying them because it's not about price. It's not a proxim uh, about proximity. And it's not about now. In the need-based in, uh, industry, it's about price, proximity, and now. In a want-based industry, it's about human connection in a place I can call my home. 